what I want to do now is uh, spend a little time on explaining a, a little computer program I wrote a while back that specifically shows the Cottrell equation. And I'd, I'd recommend that you maybe play a little bit with the Cottrell equation in this program, which is under the download section of the, uh, of the web page. So if you go to the web page, you can find it there. It's under the download. It's called Cottrell. And I'll bring it up on the computer screen. You see it here. And uh, basically what it does is just plots those equations that we derived in class. And uh, you can change some parameters. You can see the number of electrons, the area, the diffusion coefficient, the concentration. These tend not to be so critical. Two critical parameters are these two down here. One's the T range, which is the time range. And it's set now for 10 seconds. And the other is the X range, which is, uh, is the distance out in solution that we're going to be looking at. Uh, because we're looking at an area of the, or a, a, a region of the electrode solution interface, we want to specify how far out. So we can think, well, let's look at only the first 10 micrometers, or let's look at the first 100 micrometers of that interface. And so we're looking at here the, um, the first 100 microns, or 0.01 centimeters. And let's first of all show you what happens under linear diffusion conditions for the area. And so let's show that here. And what you're seeing is a plot on the top here of current versus time. And it's going to go out to 10 seconds. And obviously, it's not quite real time. But there's the, the current that you would observe for these particular conditions. And this is the time, so there's five seconds. And what you can see is that t to the minus 1 half behavior as we predict. Down here in the bottom, you see the concentration of species O as a fraction of the bulk concentration. Oops. And um, this should say x. You know, the thing erased it. But uh, what you see is the gradient. And you see at t equals 0. And then I show kind of a, in an animated form the previous gradients. And you can see that at shorter times, that gradient is much steeper than at longer times. And in fact, it's kind of linear at very long times, as you'd expect. Now, that's only because we're only looking at the at that first 100 microns of solution. So if we drop back and look at the first uh, millimeter of solution, uh, we get a little bit different view. But you can still see that that gradient will be varied. Of course, the time doesn't matter because we're only looking at that concentration thing. All right. And so let's stop that here. Let's change the time to uh, a little bit longer time scale. Let's drop. Let's make it up to, uh, to uh, a million seconds. Let's see what happens. Now here, the gradient drops to very low values almost immediately because we're because we're look, looking at times that are fractions of a million seconds. So, but notice the current is going to drop to pretty small values, although. On the time scale in which we're plotting it, it really doesn't look any different than it looked before. At all points, we're going to get this t to the minus 1 half behavior. But if you do look at the diffusion current, you'll see that it's 1.8 micro uh, nanoamps, 180 nanoamps about there. Let's go back to uh, 10 seconds and 100 micrometers. And you can see the current at the end is going to be closer to uh, um, 100 or, or microamps or so. So that longer time scale, we do get less current. So for a linear diffusion problem, we basically get the same result that you'd expect from the theory and that we've already derived. And you can see this linearizing as the slope becomes shallower and shallower, the current drops off to reflect that. Now, as I mentioned, if our electrode, if our electrode response is no longer considered to be planar, that can be considered to be either a distortion or a uh, disagreement between actual and theoretical, or we can actually derive the the current time behavior for spherical electrodes. And we can pop that in. And if we do that now, we can add a spherical diffusion event. 
And in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to assign a radius to our electrode. And so in this case, we're going to make a radius of our electrode uh, what it would be to give us the same area as before, about 0 0.29, 0 0.28 centimeters. So let's compare. We had at the end a diffusion current of about 54 microamps. Um, when we put in a spherical electrode, the basic effect is that at longer time scales, the diffusional process is <coughs> not limited by the, is not, is not, um, well with the linear process what happens is that as soon as we re remove all the material close to the electrode it has to diffuse into, to, uh, to have new. Whereas in a spherical process there is actually a more efficient spherical, uh, uh, more efficient diffusional process feeding material into it. And what we'll see actually a little bit later is, is how that works. Let me change the time range. It doesn't look that much different on this time scale, although if you do look very carefully, it does look slightly different at the longer time scales. Let's make our time a little bit longer. Let's go back to that million second time scale range and the one millimeter um, thing. Now let's do that plot. First of all, remember before with linear diffusion, that gradient was nearly flat at this point. It's not now. Also notice the current changes much more slowly at this long time scales. And that's a reflection of the different diffusional process. It's the same basic problem except that we've gone from a linear, a planar electrode to a spherical electrode. And so all we've done is really change the diffusional process, the mass transport to the system. And by going to a spherical electrode, we've made the mass transport more efficient. And we've made it so that instead of going to zero at long time scales, actually we go to a, um, some fixed value at long times. And at a million seconds is not a very, uh, not a kind of experiment we'd be interested in doing typically, but what we can do is we can observe the spherical electrode response if we go to say a, um, a 30 micron radius electrode, go back to 10 second experiments and look at time scales again that are say uh, 100 microns next to the surface and now we see this approach to a, a nearly constant value with our smaller disk even at times that are about 10 seconds, five seconds or so. So by making the electrode smaller, we've made the time to onset to the spherical diffusion effect uh, uh, much more rapid. At short time scales, we still see this effectively what looks like linear diffusion here. Uh, and if we looked at even shorter times, it would still look like linear diffusion until it gets long enough that the spherical diffusion part takes over. Let me just show you quickly. Um, if I switch from spherical to planar, you see what happens. Notice the shape of the concentration gradients in the planar diffusion field. Go back to spherical and you can see there's a lot more current for the same area of electrode and the gradients are much less shallow. And we can drop back and forth between the two to see that effect. So there's the very shallow gradients for linear diffusion, the less shallow gradients giving us larger currents for, for the um, spherical diffusion. And so, and you can, you can see where with the, Linear diffusion, there is really no, uh, everything scales with time directly, so it doesn't matter what the area is, it's just the scaling factor. Whereas with the spherical diffusion, the area actually has a significant effect on the shape of the current time behavior. So that does suggest that in addition to area in the spherical diffusion situation, you're going to have another variable that will be a radius in the uh, expression. And so I'll, uh, I'll, again, I would suggest that you maybe play with that a little bit and you can see uh, 
where things are going, and you could probably maybe even plot these um, theory versus um, time on a spreadsheet and plot them and see the, the proper shape of the current time relationship. Okay, what are we doing here? We got a little bit more time. All right, let's, uh, let's look at another little um, part of it. Part of the uh, experiment. We've said uh, we've already we've looked at the case where we've looked at the what we call the Cottrell expression. Let's look at the case when we can allow arbitrary potential steps. And now in the Nernst case, we only allow potential steps out to the point where we had the C at the electrode surface was equal to zero. If we allow arbitrary potential steps, that means that C concentration at the electrode surface at all times greater than zero may not be zero. In fact, it'll be some, vet, some function of either the Nernst equation or of the kinetics of the system. So let's first discuss only the situation when we have reversible reactions. In other words, no, at all times we're at equilibrium. And that's not a, always the best assumption, but that makes it simpler to, to solve. So in other words, the Nernst equation can be used to, to help us solve the equation. Whereas if we didn't allow reversible reactions, the Nernst equation could not be used because the Nernst equation is only for equilibrium systems. All right, so let's go back to our standard equation. And you see why we derive that, because we don't have to re-derive it. We can always go back to the Laplace space, and then we can put in just a new boundary condition and get um, a new equation for a different condition. Okay. Okay, what are the other conditions? Well, we're going to maintain boundary condition that for time is equal to zero, um, concentration of uh, O is going to be equal to the bulk. And also we're going to maintain the boundary condition as we've already had in the, in the thing at the concentration of R at all times is equal to, to zero at the electrode surface. Wait a minute. Yeah, at time at time equal to zero. All right. So since we have to consider. the concentration of R, we now Well, let's, why do we have to consider the concentration of R? Well, we have to consider the concentration of R because since we're doing an arbitrary potential step, there will be two parts of the system. We'll have a oxidized and reduced molecules can be present simultaneously at the electrode surface. So we do need, because we're going to use the Nernst equation, we need to know both the concentration of O and the concentration of R. So we can substitute in the, uh, what R will be. Now, it will be the same equation as here for O, except that there will be no initial concentration of R. There's no bulk concentration of R present. So that term drops out. But there will be a B term, which will be, have to be solved. And so we're using, we've got C sub O bar, and we've also got C sub R bar as something to, to consider. Now, what makes this simpler for us to solve is we have a flux balance equation that can be used. And the flux balance or the mass balance equation in the Laplace plane is equal to this. 
can take the derivative of these and substitute, we take the derivative of this and we can substitute these expressions in. And what we'll do is get uh, the following equations. If we take the derivative of these and substitute it into these equations here, uh, we get minus A sub S, or A is a function of S, D to the 0, 1 half, S to the 1 half. That's something we've seen before. And um, if we get then on the other half, that's due to the species R. Now the Laplace variable S to the 1 half cancels out under these conditions. And um, we get B to the S equal to minus A to the S. And we use this symbol, I forget what they call that in Greek, but, and that is just a shorthand way of um, specifying this ratio D O over D R to the one half. Now, often we'll just make that equal to one, assuming that the diffusion coefficient of O and R are the same, but sometimes we can't make that assumption. So that's, that's nothing that we haven't done before, and we, don't have, we haven't really applied any new boundary conditions to the system at this point. What we can do now, though, is apply our new boundary condition that suggests that we will have an arbitrary potential step, and then it also will be at equilibrium. So the reversible boundary condition requires equilibrium to be maintained at the electrode surface, and we know that under those conditions, that means that we can use the Nernst equation. So the Nernst equation can be used as a boundary condition uh, in our system. So E is equal to E0 plus RT over NF, natural log, and the Nernst equation applies in the bulk, but it also applies at the electrode surface. As long as the, we've got a certain potential at the electrode surface, the ratio of the concentrations at the electrode surface will be given by the Nernst equation at equilibrium. Uh, we can rearrange this a little bit to make it easier to, um, to uh, deal with. For example, we can write the ratio of CO over CR. Uh, we'll use the Greek letter theta to indicate that ratio. And that then becomes equal to E to the NF RT E minus E zero prime. And the Laplace transform of that is the only part that really changes in the Laplace space, and the concentration of O is OS, concentration of R, OS, is equal to theta. Because these terms don't get changed in the Laplace space. All right a few more steps. That's quite simple, actually, once we've already derived the control equation. So all we have to do is take this boundary condition and use it just like we used the other boundary condition as before, which was the, at all times, the concentration of O at the electrode surface is zero. In this case, this is the new boundary condition that we're going to be using. And I'm not going to actually go through that. You can actually do it yourself. I would recommend it to make sure you understand what's going on here. It'll save a little bit of time. Just write down the expression. And notice so far it looks a lot like the Cottrell equation, but we've added in a term that is equal to 1 plus that squiggle, squiggly E times theta. And let's define a uh, a value I sub D, which we'll define as the Cottrell expression. So this is the 
a value that we can use, for example, as a normalizing value of the uh, current. This would be the value for the Nernst, not the Nernst equation, but the Cottrell condition, where the current, where we make that one condition where we step all the way to the plateau. If that's the case, then I is always going to be equal to ID over 1 plus squiggly E times theta. Okay? So all we need to know is the Cottrell equation and that squiggly E theta to derive the relationship for any particular potential that we step to as long as we make the additional assumption that we've got still reversible case. In other words, we've got rapid kinetics. So if we plot current versus time, we've got a kind of a, a complicated plot here. But um, let's see if we can get through it. We can draw, we'll get a curve that would be, for example, for um, squiggly E theta equal to zero. And that basically means that E zero prime, or E is, e is very negative. In other words, we're well past the E zero point and we're at a point where we have basically the Cottrell would hold. So this is essentially the Cottrell curve. It is, it is exactly the Cottrell curve. And then we would get curves that would be something like this, that essentially would just be scaled uh, for different values of E theta. so on. And you can, you can see how that, those curves would take place. And so what are we doing? These, these E thetas are different potentials that would be on the potential, on the curve somewhere. All right? Somewhere along that curve. So if we draw that, we guess we have it on the, in the notes and you can see E theta approximately zero here on the plateau. Of course, it will never be exactly zero. It would be zero, it would have to be an infinite potential, but we're, it would basically be zero at that point. Uh, but then we'd have values of two and one somewhere along the curves. So let's just say, for example, that that would be E theta is equal to one here. E theta equal to two under those conditions. One last thing for this idea. We can actually think about taking and monitoring the current as a function of some time. Rather than measuring the whole um, curve, we can actually think, well, let's measure the current at, let's say, a time that we'll call tau or tau prime or tau double prime, whatever we want to talk about. What we got here is then is a set of current time points. If we plot a current potential, well, actually it'd be more, uh, this would be a, a better, a better um, value for that. What we get is a, a set of what they call a sampled voltammogram. 
each of these circles would be essentially the sampled for say values at tau, tau prime and tau double prime. So essentially we're going down and we'd sample for a bunch of different E thetas along this tau line. And if we do that and we plot the current that we measured at each of these points along one particular value of tau, we get a, a, a curve that looks just like this. That's what they call a sampled current voltammogram. And what you see then is for a reversible case, that E one half value is equal to E zero prime. So this is one way to generate a value, uh, a current potential curve. Um, and then the mass transfer coefficient for these would be some function of time, as you'd expect. We can derive that later. Okay. And, uh, now for any given time, for a given, for a fixed tau, the current as a function of tau is equal to the I sub D value at tau, one minus squiggle, squiggly E theta. And that's, that's just what we've written before uh, over here. And um, so given what we know already about the Nernst equation, the way we've defined it, we know that, that this is the, this is true, and then also theta is equal to I D tau minus I tau over squiggly E I tau. So E zero prime equal to R T over NF okay remember that this is the uh, squiggly E term here D sub R over D sub O plus RT NF natural log one half is equal to E zero prime minus RT over NF um, natural log of this term here or again using the squiggly E term like so. So these equations are the same exact equations as we derived in chapter one where we actually use uh, a semi-empirical parameter. We use that mass transfer coefficient. Here we've actually derived using real mathematics the equation that we predict and that we derive using the semi-empirical methods in chapter one. So we have a good correspondence between um, a, a sort of a simple hand-waving hand type derivation and, and a more rigorous derivation here. And so that's, that's what we're looking for. So we need to see a nice correspondence. That current potential curve then is dependent on the time that we sample, but that's, only, that's the only thing it's dependent on. Okay. I'll stop here, we've probably gone far enough.